our next presentation, macular damage in glaucoma. So Donald Hood is invited. He was the first to describe it. And therefore, we're going to understand why it happens at early stage of glaucoma. Thank you uh, for inviting me. I hope next time we can meet in person. So the topic I'm going to talk about today is early glaucoma damage and how it can affect your central or so-called macular vision. And here are my financial disclosures. So just a little bit of review of things that you know, but I want to make sure that we're using the same terms. So we know that uh, glaucoma kills retinal ganglia cells in their axons. So the regions here that are affected are the inner plexiform layer, where the ganglion cells synapse onto the bipolars, the retinal ganglion cell layer, where the cell bodies of the ganglion cells are, and then the retinal nerve fiber layer here, which contains um, uh, the axons from the ganglion cells, as well as uh, blood vessels and glial cells. So these are the three regions that are affected. All right, the other uh, anatomical aspects you have to understand to understand glaucoma is how the axons from the ganglion cells, sometimes called retinal nerve fibers, travel in bundles to the optic disc. So here's a schematic you've all seen that's meant to capture the following characteristics. First, ganglion cells on the disc side of the fovea send their axons more or less straight in well, the ganglion cells on the opposite side, their axons arc around and avoid the fovea. And they bunch up here in the inferior disc, because remember, this is only a small part of the back of the eye. So you've got axons coming from lots of other places. They bunch up here, and this inferior quadrant is particularly vulnerable to damage from glaucoma. Same thing is happening up here, and this is another region that's particularly vulnerable to glaucoma. All right, now because of this anatomy and because damage due to glaucoma occurs at uh, or in the disc, you get these characteristic arcuate defects. So the traditional view about macular vision is that it's not affected. Central vision is not affected by early glaucoma. And the reason for it is that it's traditionally assumed that these are the most vulnerable regions here, but the axons from the ganglion cells in the macular or central part of your eye come into this temporal region that's less vulnerable to uh, damage. So again, this is the macula here. It's plus or minus eight degrees. I'll say more about that in a moment. All right, the other thing just uh, you have to remember is what OCT can do. So it's a non-invasive uh, technique, a way to measure human retinal anatomy. And it uses uh, light the way that ultrasound uses sound. But because light has a much shorter wavelength, it has much better spatial resolution. So here's a line scan through the back of my eye here. You're looking at about this much of the back of my eye. Here is uh, post-mortem histology, not mine. This is some other deceased human. And if I, you scale this up, it would fit more or less in here, right? And so here shows you the comparison between the light microscope here and the OCT. And so the retinal nerve fiber layer is up here. So that's made up of axons from the ganglion cells. It's very thin near the fovea because there aren't too many axons. And then the retinal ganglion cell plus inner plexiform layer. And so again, glaucoma kills retinal ganglion cells in their axons. So if this is a, an example of a, a ganglion cell here, that would be its axon traveling into the optic nerve. And the retinal ganglion cell plus inner plexiform layer is affected by glaucoma. And so is the retinal nerve fiber layer. So the first question we asked about 10 years ago is can we really measure retinal ganglion cell uh, layer thickness in humans? So here's a, 
some data from a study published in 2012 in which we had both uh, in which we had uh, 128 healthy individuals and we had disc scans of uh, centered on the uh, phobia and disc scans centered on the disc these are relatively standard scans each of these scans had 128 horizontal so-called B scans that's what one of them looks like the software segments the layers here so that's the retinal nerve fiber layer and that's the retinal ganglia cell plus interplex foam layer all right so here's the a, a pseudo color thickness map for one individual that's the retinal ganglia cell plus interplex foam layer again you can see it's dark here that means very thin and it's dark red here that's very thick and what you're seeing is the donut shaped ring of thick ganglion cells around the fovea and this is what it looked like for 128 control wise this ring has a radius of eight degrees and by macular i'm going to mean the central plus or minus eight degrees this is this represents only uh, less than two percent of the total area of your retina but it has over 30 percent of your ganglion cells and it's so important for your ability to see faces to read to drive and so on all right again if we superimpose it on here you can see where the thick regions of ganglion cells are so what we asked was are we really measuring retinal ganglion cell plus thickness of the macula so about the time we published this work, there was, uh, we, we were doing this work, the uh, Christine Kersier and colleagues were looking at uh, human retinal layers uh, in histological sections of 18 donor eyes. And here's her results. So what she's doing is, the, is studying the same region we are, but she's looking at the histology across this uh, um, across the uh, fovea and plotting the retinal ganglion cell plus the uh, interplex foam layer thickness in histology versus distance from the center of the fovea so that's the foveal center that would is where it's on oct notice it's thicker here in her data right and thinner there and we see the same thing in our data if we actually just measure the OCT and put it on top of the histology, you can see you get pretty good agreement. If you correct her data for the shrinkage that she reports in her study, you get this beautiful agreement. So we can measure human retinal ganglion cell thickness in vivo. And again, for our purposes, we define the macula as plus or minus eight degrees. All right, this same study had 156 eyes from 113 patients that were either suspects or uh, glaucomas or glaucoma patients. And they all had 24-2 visual fields and they could either be normal, that is suspects, or they could be abnormal in eyes with glaucoma. So let me remind you about this 24-2 visual field. It's static automated perimetry so you put your chin here and you press a button whenever you see lights and this is the report right now this is the most standard report that's done in the states i don't know if it's the standard one done here in uh, russia or not but in i want to remind uh, you in any case that the subject is detecting very brief, very small spots of light. And that these are spaced very cr crudely or grossly or coarsely. They're spaced every six degrees, starting up and over three degrees from fixation. And that's the macula. These numbers here, not important, but let me just remind you that the way you read this is this minus 13 means that this patient at this point was 1.3 log units less sensitive than age match controls 
or about 1 20th as sensitive, or in other words, needed 20 times the light. This picture here plots the data in terms of probability. So a little spot here without a symbol means within normal limits, and then the other symbols are significant at these different levels. And then I'm going to make use of this summary statistic mean deviation, which can be thought of uh, to a first approximation anyway, as the average of all these values. This is the most common visual field test used to diagnose glaucoma. All right, so let's focus on the macula data from these patients. So that's macula thickness for healthy control. So we separated the eyes into the control healthy eyes that were age matched to the patients. So that's the average retinal ganglion cell thickness. And then this would be the normal range for the patients. They had mean deviations better than minus 1.5. This would be called normal to mild glaucoma um, because the mean deviations were better than uh, minus 6. And then this is moderate. Uh, we didn't have very many advanced. All right, notice that the thickness here, follow the black arrows, gets thinner. The, thick, the retinal ganglion cell thickness gets less and less. And one way to show this is you can take the controls, uh, you can take the patients and subtract the control values and get this. So now this is a thickness plot where dark red means much thinner than normal, dark green, uh, green means not thinner than normal. So the thing I want you to notice here is that the macular retinal ganglion cell plus interplex foam layer thickness decreases with severity. And, probably even more importantly, that in this normal range you can also already see decreasing. So the macula can be damaged very early in the glaucomatous process. The macula can be damaged very early in the glaucomatous process. So is there other data in the literature that supports this that's been ignored? And the answer is yes. Here's a nice study that was done in 1984, um, in which look, they looked at locations in the visual field with the earliest damage. So they had almost 3,000 eyes with high endocular pressure. 45 eyes showed progression from normal to abnormal during the study. 45 eyes. This is a slightly confusing plot, but it shows you the number of eyes. Uh, it shows you how many of the 45 eyes showed progression at a particular point. So right here, you can count this 10. 10 eyes had early glaucomatous damage at this location. That's the blind spot. But I want you to notice that within the 10 degree circle here, right, you had early glaucomatous damage. So early or initial damage can appear in the central 5 degrees, especially in the upper visual field. Again, the macula is damaged early in the glaucomatous process. All right, the second point is macular damage is poorly sampled by this 24-2 visual field. So here's, let's take a look at this thickness plot here. Those, uh, that's the location of the 24 test locations. Test, uh, uh, 24 test uh, locations. But that's before you take into consideration retinal ganglion cell displacement. Again, that, this is dark red here is most is thinning. So if you want to do this comparison right, you need to take the displacement of the ganglion cells near the fovea into consideration. Because remember, light falling here, where that red arrow appears, is actually stimulating ganglion cells over here where the green arrow appears. So what we did is we made use of this study from uh, Drasdo et al., from uh, Christine Curcio's lab. And what they did in this study is they chose a receptor and then traced on electromicrographs the uh, axon from the receptor that goes to the bipolars and then to the ganglion cells. And they said, here, 
light falling here actually stimulates ganglia cells out there. So we corrected the locations based on the anatomy. So this is before you take the displacement into consideration. That's after. So the damage due to early glaucoma falls largely within the central four points in the 24-2 test. So the second point I want to make is macular damage can be missed on standard 24-2 visual field tests. Here's an example. This is a patient tested on the same day with a 24-2 field test and then a test with, uh, uh, with, with more test points, the 10-2. So again, the macular is this region here. And I'll remind you that these points are spaced every six degrees. The 10 2 test has many more points within the macula because these are spaced every two degrees, starting at uh, up and over one degree. So, see this defect with this red arrow? Where is it here? To see what's happening, you can take these points from the 24 2, scale them up here, and put them on the 10 2. And notice that this deep defect here is actually falling between the points. Now, a number of studies have documented that the 24-2 can miss or underestimate macular damage, and that macular damage is common in early glaucoma. Some of these are from our labs, some of these from other labs. Okay, third, on average, there's much greater damage in the inferior retinal region upper visual field. So this is the inferior retinal region or upper visual field. You can see there's more damage here than the black arrow and more damage here, the red arrow, than where the black arrow is. So why? You know, why early, is there early macular damage? And why is it more likely in the upper visual field or lower retina? All right, so again, this is the traditional view. We have central macular vision is typically not affected by glaucoma, right? And that's because these axons from the macula are thought to go into the temporal region. Here's what we've found, and now we have a fair amount of evidence from our lab and other labs. If this is the plus or minus eight degrees, I'll remind you that this is where the most damage is in eyes with early to moderate glaucoma. Those are the vulnerable regions. All of these ganglion cells here send their axons into the less vulnerable temporal quadrant, as expected. These axons here, of course, go into the more vulnerable regions. Those are your classic arcuates. Same here. However, what we've found is that these ganglion cells send their axons right into the most vulnerable part of the disc. And we call this the macular vulnerability zone. So that's a vulnerable region, that's a vulnerable region, that's a, also a vulnerable region, and that's the macular vulnerability zone. And there's a fair amount now of anatomical and behavioral data that support this model. Let's go back to this study we mentioned before from 1984 that's largely ignored, right? And I reminded you that they had evidence here that early or initial damage can appear in the central five degrees, especially in the upper field, right? So let's take these data. Let's flip them across the along the horizontal meridian so they're in retinal view and superimpose them on our model. And you can see that those points are more or less falling in our more vulnerable region. And the less vulnerable region has fewer points. The vulnerable macular region is among the first to be affected. The model, our model also predicts that the less vulnerable region is the last to be affected. So here's a study. Uh, any of you who see advanced patients see fields like this. I'm sure this was the first one I could find in the literature. But visual fields of patients with advanced glaucoma often show this asymmetrical preservation of the macula. So again, if we put this, if we flip this field into uh, um, retinal view and line up the, the uh, fixation and the um, 
center of the disk, you can see the agreement. That's that region there. And here's some data from Dr. Liebman and Dr. Rich's patients. We just chose eight of patients with advanced glaucoma, and you can see that that less vulnerable region is the last to go. All right. The third point I want to make is early macular damage can be widespread as well as local. So on average, there's much greater damage in the inferior region. But what about this? That looks abnormal. That looks abnormal. That looks abnormal. Okay. So about five years ago, we studied um, eyes with macular damage. And the damage was confirmed with both OCT and visual fields. And many of them uh, had shallow widespread damage, uh, sometimes with local damage superimposed. So here's an example. This is an eye you could easily miss because you might think that it's, if you'd only look at the pattern deviation. However, the OCT suggests there's diffuse damage in this eye. And there are many early reports, by the way, in the visual field literature of early diffuse damage. So there are two reasons why early damage includes the macula. Local defects often include the macular vulnerability zone, but you can also have overall diffuse or widespread damage. And um, our colleague Dana Blumberg, um, along with Jeff Liebman, uh, have shown that diffuse macular damage in early to moderate glaucoma is associated with decreased visual function. And we think these are the patients that have these vague complaints about blurriness or trouble with light, and, you know, going from light to dark and so on. All right, the fourth point is that the, uh, if you only get, uh, you want to obtain OCT volume scans of the macula, because if you only get OCT of the optic disc, you're going to miss macular damage. And again, here's a study that we did a couple of years ago in which we had eyes that had confirmed macular damage. They were confirmed on both the OCT, right? So you can see the missing part of the field here, and on the visual field, right? Many of these eyes will look normal on commercial disc uh, reports. So that defect there, there, where is it here, okay? Finally, the last point I want to make is you want to topographically compare your visual fields and your OCT information. So if you flip this to field view, and you can now superimpose the abnormal regions on this and the abnormal regions on the OCT. So these are probability plots here. Okay, so to conclude, glaucomous damage commonly involves the macula. It can result in both early local and widespread loss of vision. It can be missed if you look at a 24-2 visual field or a pattern deviation plot. You need 10-2 visual fields. And it's important to get OCT macular cube scans and retinal ganglion cell maps. It's important to compare a 10-2 visual field to your ganglion cell probability maps. If you want to know more about this, We've got two long reviews in progress in retinal eye research. We've got two shorter, just a couple of page perspectives in Journal of Glaucoma and IOVS. And you can find lectures on my website. And here's a little uh, QR that would take you there. Thank you. Donald, thank you very much. It was really a brilliant lecture, and I'm so glad we had a unique opportunity, a chance, actually, to share your outstanding results with Russian doctors. And I want to remind you that more than 500 doctors were listening to your lecture, and you explained and anatomically substantiated why these particular areas are damaged or involved, these anatomical zones or areas. There are questions, and most important question, while macula is damaged or involved in glaucoma eyes, we just heard from Dr. Park that in normal intensive glaucoma, most early lower uh, areas, lower 
hemisphere of the macula would be damaged or involved in normal normal tension glaucoma. Glaucoma. How to explain it? Yeah. So the, uh, the simple answer is we don't know. The the general question actually is why is that inferior quadrant of the disc so uh, vulnerable? And mm -hmm. there is many explanations other as there are factors. Mm -hmm. Some think it has to do with the biomechanics. Some think it has to do with the vascular supply. Some think it has to do with simply crowding from so many axons. The answer probably is a combination of those because when you get to the lamina cribosa, all those factors interact. Uh, that's also the area where there are the most disc hemorrhages, of course. So that's really obviously related to those factors as well. Thank you very much, dear Donald. We do know hemorrhages, ONH hemorrhages, are more often seen in normal tension glaucoma. I'm also very much interested in this particular question because currently we, be, we use OCT widely in all patients and we see that parafovia, in parafovia, the capillary network is damaged at very early stage. And we always see this involvement in fast progressing glaucoma even in normal IOP. It's in lower hemisphere, much earlier before the thinning of uh, ganglion cell layer. Uh, therefore, it will help us to understand the early damage, macular damage. Therefore, probably the answer comes very soon. And I'm, I will use the opportunity and also want to ask you, we know your research in electrophysiology of visual function. So for diagnosis of glaucoma, should we really concentrate on structural changes, investigation of structural change, or functional um, techniques are also important, functional studies are also important? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question. At uh, one time, uh, we tested all our uh, glaucoma patients, first with the uh, uh, ERGs, multifocal patterns, and then later, or more recently, with multifocal VEPs. We now do no electrophysiological testing on our glaucoma patients, because what we find is if you get macular and disc cube scans, both of them, or a wide field that has both of them, and this is important, you get not only 24-2s, but 10-2s, right? Then the structure function comparison is the way to go, and there's no need for electrophysiology. Why oh, yeah, I see, therefore, Thank you very much. In modern perimetry, there's an accent on 10-2 protocol. This is what we need. Dr. Demarais came to St. Petersburg quite recently during White Nights, and there was a question to the speaker, should we really use this 10-2 test in all patients? As far as as I remember, when we see fast progressing cases, therefore, we should concentrate on this particular area. From your point of view, should we use perimetry 10-2 in all fast progressing patients suspected with suspected glaucoma? Yes, so, the, so what we teach our fellows and, and what we preach is that anyone who deserves a 24-2 deserves a 10-2 also. If you do an OCT first, you can actually decide which one you start with first. So I work with some specialists who will do a 10-2 first. Which you follow the patient with will depend upon where the damage is. Many of the patients have, have macular damage and they should be followed with 10-2s. Some of the patients have damage that's largely outside the macula, that can occur. You will probably follow that patient with a 24-2. Thank you very much. We'll actually use your 
your advice, your very nice hint. Thank you so much for joining us today. For us, it was a great honor, really great honor. It's a very important and very timely webinar for all of us, because unfortunately, doctors at least in our country, still continue to use measuring IOP measuring, monitoring of IOP only. Therefore, it was a chance to concentrate on the specific aspects that are outside um, the consideration of our doctors, probably because OCT technologies are not available everywhere. In, uh, the, even in the USA, monitoring is not always possible with uh, continuous use of OCT. But nevertheless, it's a chance to inform our doctors that OCT should be used wherever it is possible. From your point of view, how often OCT should be used in our patients for monitoring purposes? So, so that's something that uh, we're working on, uh, uh, we being the, myself and Gus uh, DeMores and also the next speaker, Jeff. And I think the, the, the question is how often will you need a visual field? Because if you have an OCT machine, it's so easy on the patient, every visit they should have an OCT. So the question we're trying to answer is if they have a visit, if they have an OCT every visit, how often do they need the visual field? Not the reverse. That clear. Well, it's very clear. It's very clear. I do remember a very interesting presentation. It is in Pacific of your colleague, Professor Liebman. He just substantiated to a certain degree a statement that perimetry, perimetry is something um, that is becoming already historical, so we should concentrate on OCT. Therefore, I decided to ask you, especially keeping in mind that there's a pre-perimetric stage and we do not see any changes in visual fields. Probably if you use protocol 10-2, we will be able to detect such changes earlier, and I do agree with you that OCT should be performed during each visit because it will allow us to detect progression earlier. Dear colleagues, uh, the British uh, trial on Latanopros that I mentioned, how, why it was actually conducted so quickly. To, uh, it was demonstrated very quickly that Latanopros reduces. Um, so 11 perimetries were performed in each patient. It became quite evident very early where visual field loss defects appear at the earliest. Uh, dear colleagues, we have to stop this discussion because of time limit. Thank you very much, dear Donald.